It's another side that like wants to take more. It wants to go that one more round. Because like going that one more round when you don't think you can, that's what makes all the difference in your life. You know what I mean? Welcome to One More Round, the Rocky Series Podcast, Episode 2. With me today, of course, is Kyle and Katie. Kyle, how you doing? Doing great. How are you guys? Doing good. It's been a busy week, and today is going to be busy, so I have to get a ton of caffeine in. I leave tomorrow for yet another vacay. Another vacation. Yes. I am going to Ecuador, the Galapagos, the Amazon, another trip of a lifetime wow before this earth of ours explodes there's a lot to see so yeah doing that so it's just been busy trying to get stuff packed and the house cleaned for grandma and grandpa to come babysit rambo and balboa but yeah good well i i go back to work tomorrow (laughs) we're talking about polar opposites my leave and everything's over yeah i'm going back to work tomorrow back to the grind back to the busy life but i've had a great break it's finally over all things come to an end good and bad i say so uh, kyle's just getting over a cold living the dream over here (laughs) with all the germs from your kids daycare yeah i know my immune system's getting work out i feel like with the pandemic i didn't get sick forever because i was never around anyone Mm -hmm. and then once like the restrictions lifted and my son started going to daycare and stuff it was just my immune system was weak and pathetic (laughs) now it's paying the price you reminded me of that uh, guy from Rocky IV. Weak and pathetic. Weak and pathetic. This nation has become. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> now, before we get to the emails, Katie, I want to say you did a great job last week at the time of this recording when you guest starred on episode three of It's a Long Road, the Ramble Series podcast. I'm looking forward to the release of that. Uh, you did a wonderful job and look forward to having you on again. And Kyle, he will be Ooh. episode four if you're still up for that, Kyle. Yeah, is that next week? Yes. Yeah. He sounds thrilled, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I am excited to do that, actually. I didn't realize Sunday mornings my wife has work phone calls. Oh. Before we go into the emails, I wanted to make sure that Kyle is at the ready with our bum count. Yeah, I got it right here. We encountered six bum references so far. Uh, just to recap, Brian <laughs> predicted 36 bums through the entire film. Louise predicted 46, I predicted 56, and Katie came in at 225. (laughs) It doesn't work for just one episode because last time it was six, but it would be a good drinking game as people watch the movie. Like Now I'm not going to be able to get that out of my head, so next time I watch it, if anybody makes it a drinking game, let us know. Yeah, for sure. You'll be very drunk. Well, I'm concerned you'll die of alcohol poisoning. So I might have to be like a sip of beer or something every time. Or a sip yeah. of wine every time. Not a stop. whole drink. Not a whole drink. Like a yeah. drink. Like one gulp of whatever it is yeah, you're drinking. If you took a shot every time you heard bum, you might die. You would die, yes. Yes. That I actually, mean, not on Ryan's count. Ryan's is only like 30 something. <laughs> True, but that's actually how uh, Paulie got drunk in the film. He was counting all the bums, so he actually got progressively drunk <laughs> yeah. as the film went on. Okay, yeah. so we got a couple emails there, Katie, from our first episode. It's exciting. So, oh, if you want to send cool. us an email, send it to one more round Rocky Podcast. That is one more round Rocky Podcast at gmail.com. They're all just one word. All together, no underscore, yeah. one more round Rocky Podcast at okay. gmail.com. Yeah. And it's going to be in the description every episode if you need to look. All right, so we have one from Jared Talkstein, host of the Hyperspace podcast. He says, just finished the first episode of One More Round. Bravo. Loved the breakdown of the first fight. When Katie said that she had never really gone this deep into detail on the first fight in the movie, that was like a switch being flipped for me because I had never really explored that fight in much detail either. And that's why this show is going to rule. Our next Rambo episode is in the queue, and I'll listen soon. Great job to all involved. Thanks from Jared Toxine, host of the Hyperspace Podcast. Thank you, Jared. Yeah, that's Any comments? Awesome. Thank you. Well, no, I mean, yeah, well, yeah, that's very kind. The next one is from Doug Greenberg from the Rocky Minute Podcast. 
He says, hello, friends. I'm so excited to have you guys back in my ears covering the one and only Rocky. Even though we went through this this movie one minute at a time, I can never get tired of hearing discussions about one of my favorite movies ever. Although I've seen Rocky dozens of times, I never realized the depth of Stallone's acting until we covered it in such detail. One of my favorite scenes that portrays this is in his apartment after the Spider Rico fight. Not a word is spoken besides him rehearsing the shell shock joke, and his nonverbal acting says more than any dialogue ever could. He stares at himself in the mirror and notices his third grade picture. He looks back and forth from the picture to his reflection, and you know exactly what he's thinking. How did this innocent, fresh-faced kid become this? It's a really beautiful scene and perfectly acted. There's many instances of his nonverbal acting, and this is just a small one, but it's so powerful. Love you guys, and I can't wait for more. Doug. I couldn't agree more with you on that particular scene. It's like, I think, one of the best of the movie. And we might even get to it today. I can't. Oh, I think I we're going to. I'm being more prepared this season. I'm actually kind of gauging what we're going to watch and timeline wise in my head. So I've watched. A, you guys don't have to worry about this. I'll take care of it. But I want to make it more what kind of makes sense. Like there's certain scene breakdowns that make sense. Like, this is a good place to stop type scene. So I think today mm, the, the good place uh-huh. to stop today will be just before Rocky enters the gym. So he's about to enter the gym. Mm-hmm. He, he talks to Mike outside. Yeah. He's about to find out his stuff's on Skid Row. So yeah. let me get back to Doug. So Doug, he said it so well. In fact, he said it so well that when we get to the scene, I, <laughs> you know, he, I know, he, took, right? he took the words out it- of my mouth. <laughs> Wonderfully said, Doug. But we'll talk about it for sure today, Katie, for sure. So thank you, Doug. Yeah, thanks so much, Doug and Jared. Send us uh, emails, guys. We'd love to hear from you, uh, guys and gals who listen to our show. The emails are really special to us. It lets us know people are listening. And the insights, of course, are always spot on and well said. Okay, so before we get into the movie, there is a little bit of a sly news. And I'm going to play it for you guys. I don't know if you saw this. But did you know that Sylvester Stallone has entered the NFT game? Get, oh, no. Ugh, okay, no. So there's your initial reactions. Okay, well, let's listen to what Sly has to say about it first. Sylvester so Stallone, I love connecting with my fans. After all, we've been together for 50 years and we're tight. I'm so excited to tell you about Sly Guys, my new cool NFT collection. Every NFT is unique. Over 200 incredible attributes like boxing gloves and crazy weapons, and even my large dog, all inspired by my lifelong love of art and comic books. These NFTs are so much more than just digital collectibles. Sly Guys has a roadmap that goes the distance all the way. We're gonna have awesome merch exclusive to my Sly Guys community. And get this, your Sly Guy NFT is your membership to real life events with me, like dinners, meet and greets, a film and cocktail club, and we're planning so much more. But first, you gotta get a Sly Guy. Go get some Ethereum, set up your MetaMask or a Coinbase wallet, and get ready to mint at planetsly.com. Meet you on Planet Sly and keep punch. So it's called planetsly.com. Thoughts, initial thoughts, reactions? First of all, I hate NFTs, the whole idea of NFTs. And and actually, I'm not a big fan of crypto either. Same. I think it's a bubble. I, th- I think a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money in crypto and NFTs going forward. There might be some future for it, but I think it's pretty highly speculative and dangerous. Is an investment. Now, if you're buying one of his things, you're not necessarily an investor, so it's not a big of a deal. But NFTs give me the heebies anyways. When I see him doing NFTs, my initial reaction is pretty negative. The only thing I thought that was kind of interesting was he was saying something along the lines of if you buy one of these things, you potentially could have some sort of other benefit, like a meet and greet or something like that, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. So, I agree you know, that might be worth it, but it's like, what are you doing? Like, are you trying to, don't you have enough money? Why are you doing this? This seems kind of a, almost a little bit sleazy in my opinion. I'm not too thrilled about it. I concur a bazillion percent. I'll start with positive. My positive thoughts were I loved when Butkus showed up and he called him. One of the things you can buy is my large dog. I loved how he said that because that's how he says it in the movie. So that was basically the extent of how I thought it was positive. Negative was everything Kyle said. The only thing I would add, it cheapens him. And I don't really think this really plays to his core audience either. So what's he trying to do? This is not who his people are. I feel like some business manager talked him into doing this. Okay, right. and NFTs and crypto are a new thing. Like when he was talking about getting your Ethereum and your MetaMask and stuff, I guarantee you he doesn't know what any of that means. 
Oh, absolutely. And it, it's completely the opposite of one of the things that we kind of loved in, was it Creed? First one where he's the cloud, like his character, yeah, Rocky. Right. And like, we found right. that very endearing. And I know that Sylvester's not Rocky, but still, I just feel like it's not what his fans like at all about him. And and if anything, it turns us off. I, I think I echo a lot of what you're saying. I don't know if you saw the site there. Or are you able to see the site? Yeah. It's like Planet Hollywood. Now it's Planet Sly. Planet Is he Sly. just repurposing yeah, exactly. Planet Hollywood first, shit? Yeah, it's exactly what I thought. It's odd that they would use the word Planet Sly and with his association with Planet Hollywood. It's an odd choice um, connection, whether it was intentional or not. That's what we both thought of. I was looking at pricings. Don't see any yet. Mm. It says they haven't been announced yet. Sly guys, I guess, are like little characters here of artworks. So this is what they are. I don't know if you see them here. So yeah. it's almost like avatars. You can create your own sly avatar. But for what? No offense to people who are super into this, but do you not have anything better to do? Just in case people here aren't exactly sure what an NFT is. Like, I'm sure everyone has heard of NFTs. If you're able to talk to me like I'm fine with it, please. Like, I work in finance and investments and stuff, and NFTs are floated around as an alternative kind of investment. Not seriously in the investment community, but a lot of people see it that way. I actually made my own NFT once just as an experiment, just to see what it was all about. NFT stands for non-fungible token. And what it is, is it's usually an image or a video or a GIF or something like that. You have a, for lack of a better word, it's a digital stamp that's put on it. It uses that blockchain technology that crypto uses. So it can't really be duplicated or faked. That is yours for sure. The only thing is, is it anyone could take it and use it if they want to. Like, it's not like you own this and only you can use it or people have to pay you to use it. It's not like that at all. Anyone could just copy this picture and use it for whatever they want. You just have your stamp on it. So you could just say, I happen to be the guy who owns this. There's no real meaning to that at all. And then you could sell that right to someone else or something. And I made a NFT of a grilled cheese sandwich I cooked at lunch once. That's and awesome. I put it on the open market and no one bought it. But you have to use usually Ethereum or some other type of cryptocurrency to buy it too. To me, NFTs are worthless. It's junk. People will talk about like selling certain NFTs for like $600,000. But basically, if you're buying it for that, you're just hoping someone else will pay more. Like it doesn't have actual value behind it at all, which is the issue I have with it. You're basically just giving Sly money, really. Because it's not like you couldn't get that image otherwise. You're just putting your kind of digital stamp on it. The best way to describe it for me, too, is there's like video games where people sell in-game items for real-life money. So when you're in the game, let's say it's World of Warcraft is a popular one. A lot of people know that name. And I want a certain sword, but I can't find it. Blah, blah, blah. I'm having a hard time. I can Now, this sword, like Kyle's saying, this sword or this NFT, it's not real. It's not a real thing that I can hold. It's, ta- it's a digital code. But... I need it for my character. So I'm going to buy it with real money. And it has a value within the community of the game. I can also sell it within the game. And for World of Warcraft, gold coins. Those gold coins don't mean anything in the real world. I can't buy a house with them. But there's still a value within that community. So I think NFTs are are in Sly's Planet. It's the same idea. You can say, I own this avatar. And yes, you can cut and paste or screen capture my avatar. And just put it on your own Twitter. Say, well, I own it too now. And that's the argument against these things but like Kyle saying is that but I own the code yeah I'm the owner of this it's like when you buy a star in the heavens you know you can buy your star for hey that star is mine but Mm -hmm. everyone else is like yeah but I get to look at it too and I could just say hi I bought the one next to it like what's the real value in that I can say that star is named after me you can buy a star right but what's the value really because I can say well I bought that star for a dollar says who what does it matter I'm just saying I own it right and so but it's fandom is what I'm getting at. You don't have to like Sly or World of Warcraft. It's like saying you're a top fan. Yeah. And then on top of that, yes, Kyle, you're absolutely right with your theory. I agree with you. The guy that runs the Sly shop or the Sylvester Stallone shop, I don't know if he listens to our show. I highly doubt it or if he has any friends that listen to our show. But from what I understand with this guy, for whatever reason, I don't know how he did it, but he is like in Sly's ear. He runs the Sly shop. Of course, he's about money. But for whatever reason, he bends Sly's ear, and Sly will do whatever he says regarding merchandise. This guy can at me and let me know that I'm wrong. But if I were to guess, if anyone got into his ear, it's probably that guy said, hey, there's money to be made. Now, is he wrong? Sure, there's money to be made. Does it cheapen 
sly. I, I yeah, whatever. I mean, he's making money. People have cameos that are washed up actors. They have cameos and what have you. And a lot of actors do that, but we kind of look down on that. I mean, we shouldn't be judgy like that, but rightfully or wrongfully, we have esteem kind of assigned to these people. And for us, we do kind of have Sly on a pedestal. We don't want to see himself, for lack of a better term, like whoring himself out. I'm just looking at it pragmatically and objectively, just in the sense, I hear you're yeah. right. I know what you're saying. I mean, like, it's a business. You know, he's, he's building up his gold pile for his family. If someone were to tell me, Ryan, if, if you drew a picture, whatever it is, and I would buy it off you for $100,000 because I think you're amazing. I just love you so much, Ryan. I'd be like, really? You want to? Okay, here's a, you own this picture of me, Rye Guy. Here's a Rye Guy. It's kind of hard to turn down that kind of money. Now, does that cheapen the podcast that I do? Maybe, I don't know, but I still have the podcast you can listen to. You don't have to buy my Rye Guy, but. It doesn't equate because in your example, that's unsolicited. Somebody's like, hey, I love yeah. you, Ryan. Can I buy this thing? Oh, okay, and then he's I say, actually, hey, this is great. I wonder who else wants to do it. Then I've. Yeah. I don't well, know. True. Yeah. And people do it all the time. And it, again, it's sort of like, well, how much money is enough? Right. I hear you. It, What's why is that worth? Yeah. It's a half a billion. Okay, so you're, you're worth half a billion dollars. No matter how much money you have, seemingly you want more. When I say you, I just mean like yeah, people. Just to give you an idea, if this half a million dollars earns a 5% return, which is modest, that's not a high return. That's like very traditional type of investments. His monthly income would be two million eighty three thousand a month. You have almost more money than you can spend at that point. Yeah. Why do you need to do this? It's funny. I work with money, but I'm not a big money person. Like I'm not motivated by it really. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm like, okay, two million dollars a month. Like you're in the fractional one percent of people who make that kind of money. Of so course, yeah. Don't do this NFT shit. That bothers me. All right. Well, everyone's in a great mood now. Let's uh review. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I was like, God damn it, Sly. <laughs> Why do you have to do this? Well, at least it's not criminal behavior. And True. That is a really good point. You know, we... Yeah, no me too stuff, so we're good. Yeah, it's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's Sly being Sly, but like I said, I think I agree with Kyle. I think we have somebody in his ear. That's my theory. So I agree, I agree with your guess, Kyle, and I have a theory that I know who it is. I feel like this guy has really shown Sly the way to make money from being Sly, and I don't know how much of this Sly would do on his own had this guy not existed. That's just the way life goes sometimes. Okay. Yeah. So that's how I look at that. And Sly is an older gentleman. I mean, he is 75, 76. I think he's very bright. But I think there's some... Yeah, I think he doesn't know what he's saying. And he's reading a script in that video. People can be very persuasive. Like, some people have just mastered the art of persuasion. Right. They really can get into someone's ear. I don't know how they do it, but they, they know. So, yeah, we don't agree. I was just trying to do the voice of some of the people that might agree with it. I think it does cheapen. I agree with you guys. I just want to give the voice of I get what he's doing, but I don't. I wouldn't do it either. If I was sly, I wouldn't bother. If Ryan was a celebrity, I wouldn't do it. No. So I wouldn't do it. It doesn't make me a great person, but I wouldn't do it. Okay. Sly's done sillier things, but yeah. All right. <laughs> he did stop from my mumble shoot. He did that for $50 million or whatever. I need to rewatch that because I... No, you don't. No, because when I saw it, I was a small child and thought it was probably pretty funny. I don't know. Uh, you know what? Rewatch yeah. it and listen to our review of it again. And then the review. I remember your review. I re Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we left off last episode with Rocky asking the fighting guy, hey, when do I fight again? And he was about to start walking his neighborhood. That's really hard to hear, even when you have your headphones on full. But he's singing or whistling the Rocky theme here at the very beginning. Is he? Yes. See if you can catch it. It's like oh, said, yeah, that's right, yeah. the first few notes. He doesn't carry it all the way through, but he does do the Rocky theme. Did you catch that? Yeah. Yeah, that was... Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. you're right. Good, that was a good catch, you guys. Look at those cute puppies. Not a fan of puppies in pet stores, but this was 1976 or five. So you're absolutely right, Katie. I'm the same way. And of course, we'll get to a scene later with Buckus, yeah. his, his station in life. But <laughs> uh, no, it's weird to see these three puppies in a window. It's very odd. You would not see that today. No, 
Well, Ryan, I was going to comment just on the street here. What a depressing looking environment here that he's in. You see the shops are not well maintained. The sidewalk is not well maintained at all. It hasn't been repaved forever. It's cracked. It's broken. There's trash everywhere. Do you think that garbage uh, was placed there or was it already there? Already there, I'm sure. That's crazy. I'm sure. I'm sure Philadelphia was similar, but if you look at New York in the 70s, it looked like this, but worse. It was rough. I think Philly was it's right next door. I think it's going through something very similar. I would not want to walk down this street at this time of night here. And I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have to place trash or anything. It, that that <laughs> works already. Done That's cr- yeah, I know. You see the trash here. It's crazy how much garbage is lying around. To Kyle's point, from a female perspective, I don't like to walk down any city street at night uh, by myself. My wife and I were in a parking garage like late at night. And she's like, do you feel scared in this situation? And I'm like, no. Oh, parking <laughs> garages are yeah. the worst. Yeah. Oh, I want to say too. So Sly, when he wrote the script, he purposely wanted uh, the pet shop across from the gym, which we have here. So the pet shop we see, that's actually a fake pet shop that was created. The interior was created for the movie. The exterior for the gym is exterior only, and the interior of the gym is actually in L.A., but the exterior, of course, is in Philly. Also, we see him bouncing his black ball. Did anybody else have an issue, like hygiene issue, watching this? The whole time, he bounces the ball on those nasty streets and in the bathrooms, and he just he, that's all just getting on his hand the whole time. <laughs> Just me. I never thought about it. It's a dirty ball. He likes to play with dirty balls. Super dirty. Yeah. <laughs> Fingerless gloves, but still, I yeah, mean, There's something anyway. on his fingertips, but you're right. Maybe just the fingertips are getting it, but maybe the partial glove is partial protection. Yeah. He wanted to show the pets, though, being these young puppies. Uh, Sly wanted to show that you have the journey of these young, fresh animals out into the world where the people around them, like himself, are past their prime. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. There's a train, or maybe we don't see it, we just hear it, the train in the background. Yeah, we're going to see the trains yeah. later on, but they would time the trains on purpose when they wanted them in mm-hmm. and out of the shots. So it would be on walkie-talkies behind the scene. Okay, the train's coming, we start filming, because they, they wanted some frames with the trains and some without, so they, they had to correlate the train schedule. The shot you have it paused on now is phenomenal. That Everything is building. dark, yeah, with the Mickey's Gym sign, and it's just so dark. And I never really noticed before how decrepit the side sign is. It says professional boxing. (laughs) You could barely make it out to be Mm -hmm. saying professional. So these are the opening credits as well. So we've seen all the main characters and now we just have like sort of the secondary characters. Thayer David, Joe Spinell, Jimmy Gambina, and George Mamoli. Who is George Mamoli? Who does he play? Good question. Uh, Jimmy, of course, is Mike. Joe Spinell's Gazzo. Thayer David, I think he's like the promoter, I think. Yeah, with the carnation guy, Jurgens. Yeah. Jurgens, yeah. Jurgens, yeah. So you know which one Frank is? The Letterman jacket? Yeah. So, of course, the was... famous scene here of Take It Back. And now, apparently, Frank would sing with these guys in New Jersey. This is the real group that he was singing with on the corner. So they would do this back in the day. This is something they actually did. So they implemented it into the film. And there's a couple girls here. I don't know if you'll notice this, but there's three girls. One, two, three. And they look young. And there's one girl in particular over this guy's shoulder. You'll see when it gets close up how young she is. And she does a quick look to the camera, too. It seems like the burning trash bin is kind of gotten out of style. Like you don't see many people around a burning trash bin anymore. It seems like in the 70s and earlier, that was kind of the thing to do. Well, they got a lot of garbage around to throw in there. And that can they're using, that's that thin aluminum type can. You figure that's going to melt. Mm-hmm. Right. There was a documentary on New York in the 70s, the beginning of hip hop. One of the guys was saying that they would hook their equipment that they stole up to the electricity from one of the light posts. They just kind of MacGyvered it there. Back in the 70s, cops didn't care if you did stuff like that because they had bigger fish to fry. It was underfunded mm-hmm. and there were murders and stuff they had to deal with. Whereas in, in New York, you couldn't do that now. You couldn't wire up to a light post. Cop would be on you in two seconds. And I wonder if burning garbage on the street here, probably you couldn't do that in Philadelphia today because mm-hmm. the cops would kind of be like, no. Mm-hmm. Then back in the 70s, they're like, yeah, whatever. One of you mentioned the, how young you thought the girls were. Yeah. How old do you think these 
people are. Slice 30 in this film. We'll check out the girl here. You'll see her. Okay, there's that young girl here. She's probably uh -huh. maybe 18. So these girls were actually just literally in Philly. They only had five days, by the way, to film in Philly. So all the Philly scenes were done in five days. So they just grab locals. Hey, do you want to be in the movie? So these are not actresses per se. They're just people that were there that aren't part of the singing group. So this young girl here. I think it adds to it. I really do. Now watch this young girl coming up here. She's really young. This one here. Yeah, she looks like she's 17. No, oh, she looks like she's 13, 14. She's probably 17, I think. Oh, wow. Frank has a Letterman's jacket on. These people clearly peaked in high school. Is that what we're like? <laughs> They're going nowhere. Like a high school Letterman jacket? Is that what he's wearing? We don't get to see it after this shot, actually. They focus on this guy here that he grabs the beer from. Yes, and it's uh, a 40. <laughs> I love that. I love that. It's a wine bottle. It's a wine actually. bottle, yeah. There's Frank there. You know, there's a little boxing with his brother. Hey, hey, hands up. He ducks. Of course, uh, Rocky says, you guys, you're getting better every year. And this is to indicate that nothing has changed, really. It's just the same thing every year, over and over again. Same routine, collecting for Gazzo. Losing these club matches or winning these club matches. And these guys are singing. It's like nothing's really moving as the city's decaying. Same old, same old. Yeah. yeah. Just real quickly before we get to the apartment scene, because I think the mood really changes there. So here it all seems pretty happy. The guys singing seem happy. Rocky even kind of starts running a little bit. He's like, hey, guys. You know, like it's all very... I don't know about happy, but content, and we don't see that he's, like, unhappy. It's familiarity, I think, too. I love he kicks the garbage bag that's on the sidewalk here, and I love this. It was naturally there. We're talking about how the garbage is naturally around this place. I just love how this little garbage bag has this moment in history. You know, somebody <laughs> somebody actually buried something in the bag, dumped it out, said, I don't want this, but it's like, it ends up in a rocky field. I want to know what the journey of this garbage bag was. <laughs> It's kind of like the feather and Forrest Gump, but just the garbage bag instead. <laughs> now, the movie was produced by Erwin Winkler and Robert Chardoff, okay? These famous producers, they were young producers at the time. Erwin Winkler's still alive. I think he's 90 now. Robert Chardoff passed away, I think, in 2015. Now, according to these guys, the story of how they got Sly's Rocky script into their hands is a little bit different than what Sly has told over the years. They actually got Paradise Alley first from Sly. That was the script they got first, and they didn't want to make that. But what they recognized from that script was they recognized that Sly did have a unique writing voice. They mm. recognized his ability to write and that he was a new voice in Hollywood, a somewhat younger. He was 28, 29 at the time. So they recognized that this guy had a voice, a unique storytelling voice. And they also they saw the movie Lords of Flatbush. They also recognized Sly with that performance that he, was a, he had potential to be like a young Marlon Brando. So the producers saw it as well before Rocky even came out. Of course, they saw this potential in this young man. So they said, well, do you have anything else? You know, they didn't want to make Paradise Alley. But they wanted Sly. They knew that they had something with him. Sly said, well, I, I do have a story in mind based in Philly about a boxer. He didn't have the script written yet. He only had the story in mind. And so he quickly pounded out the script because he had an opportunity here with the producers. And he didn't want to lose it. So he quickly produced the script and they read it and they liked it. And what they liked about it was the fact that, yes, that Rocky lost the match at the end of the fight. And they said, okay, we got something here. They made Sly do it for free. And then they worked with Sly for six months on the script, tinkering with it. All done for free. So Sly did it for free. They didn't make any indication that Sly would never not be the choice and or that they weren't going to, or they offered him any kind of money. So I don't quite know where that may or may, or maybe they didn't put that in their story. But it sounds like they were with him from the very beginning. They, they always liked him. They wanted to work with him. That's the producers. So I don't know. Take it for what it's worth. I'm really glad you brought that up. It's not at all the story that Sly tells. Maybe he shopped it to somebody else. I don't know. I've also heard from other reliable sources that Sly's story is not accurate. Yeah, yeah. yeah interesting. Yeah. He likes to embellish. I mean, the story isn't as glamorous, the ones the producers tell, but it makes sense. They like Sly. Mm -hmm. They actually really liked his personality. They thought he was amicable, nice, intelligent, well-spoken, funny, and they wanted to work with him. They worked six months on the script with him, closely. Mm. So the, I don't know why they would work with him that long to not want him to be in the film. Now, the producers had to... Now, maybe between the producers and the studio, there was some argument. And that might have been what it was. That the studio who you know, fronts the money were like, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. Who is this schmuck? And But the producers believed in it. And they pushed 
They pushed, they pushed. They finally, they basically made a deal with the studio saying, look, we'll make it for a million dollars. So that it's going to be no cost to you, basically. And if, if anything goes over a million, we'll pay for it out of, our, out of our own pocket. So the studio's like, okay, knock your socks off. So that's how they got the movie made, was they told the studio oh. it's basically going to be a free movie for you to make. What do you have to lose? Does that budget also include advertising? Everything. Everything, okay. Yeah, Interesting. Actually, okay, well, I don't know about advertising back then too it was pretty it wasn't quite what it is today the business is a little bit different mm. back then i mean they did make movie trailers as we know them. they made a movie trailer that showed the whole film <laughs> <laughs> totally but anyways the film was actually made just under a million i think they actually went under budget actually funny enough, mm-hmm. like nine hundred thousand something but now that we're talking about a little bit about the production I, i'll mention this as well uh, John G. Avildsen spoke about his time with Sly here, about kind of the difference between or Sylvester Stallone and Rocky, the first film, and Sylvester Stallone and Rocky V. He said that working with uh, Stallone in this one was amazing, in that he was a hungry actor. John G. Avildsen was like, there's nothing better than a, than a starving actor. They give you everything. They give you all. They listen to everything. Sly's enthusiasm about the film was amazing. It was contagious to everyone involved. So Sly, to his credit at this time, was the driving force of this film. He energized everybody. He was positive, listened to everything that John G. told him to do. They rewrote over 300 pages of script rewrites during the filming with John G.'s uh, influence as well. And he said that, however, when he worked with Sly on Rocky V, he said it was like working for uh, Prince Lippenstein or something like that. I forget the name. But it was not the same Sly 15 years later. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Now, I love Sly. And we've mm-hmm. talked about this before that Sly is a good actor. And he can do a really good job in films when he's hungry, like Copland, when he listens to the directors. <laughs> and he knows that about himself, ironically. Him making Rocky Three, that was all about that. That was the whole theme of that movie. Yeah. To a degree, he's self-aware enough to know that about himself. But at the same time... Not quite fully as self-aware when he was at Rocky Five, according to your story there, which I, which I believe. The truth is probably in the middle. Yeah, and that's what I was saying, that I think the producers have their version. And they're not saying it didn't happen, but they're just saying that's how that's how they worked with Sly. But I don't think the producers provide the money. I think it's the studio. So the studio might have balked at Sly, offered him, hey, like, we'll take this, everything you've worked on, guys, and we'll take it for X number of dollars. And Sly's like, well, no, 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 this is me. I'm doing this. So that's probably what happened mm-hmm. as well. Okay, so he's about to enter the uh, studio here, or his apartment. Now, this apartment, guys, just you know, so the exterior, again, is Philly, but the interior of the apartment was uh, L.A. And the apartment that we see is truly what you see is what you get. That's a real apartment. All the stains, <laughs> all the... Of course. Yeah, it's it's just, I can't believe people lived in this. People live in worse, man. Wait, wait, wait. I... You said the, the interior is an actual apartment, but it's in L.A.? Correct. It's not staged? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a real place. I took a train through North Philly in 2007, and there were areas I saw that looked worse than this. This is also North Philly, by the way. In a lot of ways, it hasn't gotten better, at least some parts of it. Like, if you do Google Street View in some areas, even this this street, I actually think, from Google Street View, looks a little bit better now than it did here, but only marginally. Now, I know we we all know about the knife. It's actually a bayonet knife that's in the uh, mattress that he uses for a punch or <laughs> a punching bag. But did you Heavy catch bag. all the other knives that are in the house? That one right there yeah. in the wall or something. Yeah, yeah it's the, like a machete almost. It's a, mach- it's a machete. Yeah, it's stabbed into the wall. He's actually got more in the mirror as well, and he uses them for like his hat racks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the records here are being held up. They're being pinned <laughs> like his, his record shelf, I guess. He's pinning these. <laughs> But those are, that's actually a clothes rack, but he's using it to pin his records (laughs) instead of clothes. So it's, it is a studio apartment. Not to spoil it too much, but when Adrian moves in, eventually you're going to see quite a few small but subtle improvements that she'll make to this apartment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Looking in the fridge for beer and there isn't one, but there's like a... That's disgusting. I ugh, I can hardly watch that. Like an old, stale, just backwash left in the bottle well, on the top of the fridge. Yeah. There's no fresh beer in the fridge. I love it. There's nothing in there. He grabs a... There's a non-zero chance there's a roach in that beer. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, oh, good enough. 
So this scene is, I think the mood significantly changes. Maybe he's putting on a show for people on the exterior. Now he's home and we see the real, his real feelings about. I would have had that 90 bucks in my pocket for winning that fight. I would have got a six pack on the way home. Right? Well, to be fair, maybe he's smart with his money. You know, he's got to put away for rent. He's got to put away for rent. How much rent do you think this costs? I managed apartments. One of the tenants in the building I managed, uh, this is when I was in college. I lived in the building, too. She had been in the apartment since 1975, I think, or the same year there. The rent that she was paying at the time, like this is like 2008, I think it was about 900 bucks a month. Like it was a small apartment, but it had all of her rent increases since the 70s. And her apartment's probably better than his. Her rent was around 120 bucks a month in the 70s. Okay. My grandparents' mortgage payment on their house, which they bought in 1970, was like $110 a month. I'm guessing his rent is around 100 or maybe a little less a month. Okay. Because it's such a shitty apartment. He basically, in that fight, earned his rent there. Yeah. Not including utilities and stuff. The average beer price for a six pack in seventy six was two sixty for a six pack. Definitely stop for a six pack and some more donuts. Yes, you earned it. You uh, burned yeah. some cows in that fight. You could afford a beer or two. Treat yourself. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly, man. Give yourself a pat on the back. Have a beer. Listen to the radio. And the average rent uh, was about one hundred fifty six bucks. Okay, so we're shown the fishbowl that he's we're, he's going to go over to the fishbowl. We literally had that same hey, fishbowl. We had a beta in it. Why weren't you there, huh? You so he asked his turtles, Cuff and Link, why weren't they at the fight? Well, they couldn't catch a cab. I, I love how he's talking to his turtles there. Hey, I have a question for you guys since you're pet owners. Do you ever have your pets talk back to you? Like you'll say something to your pets and then you'll, you'll do a voice for them to talk back? I've never spoken for my pet, no. Not in that way. Oh. I have yet. I've talked to them, though. Yeah, I, like, assign a voice to them more so, like, for other people. Like, I'm trying to translate almost what they would be saying. To, oh, Grandma, hi. When my parents come in, and, yeah. I guess I'm mentally irregular is what I'm trying to say, because I do that all the time, and I make my dog sound like an asshole to me, even though he's super nice. <laughs> I'm like, just let me love you, like, when they don't want to be snuggled, and I'm just, like, just I just want to snuggle with you. And then I put a, vo- a voice to them, like, Mom. I'll say something stupid, and then I'll just randomly say my dog's voice, something that, like, criticizes me or says something mean to me. I guess I'm mentally regular is what I'm trying to tell you. We all are a little bit. We are all very mentally regular. Did anybody else think, dude, that bowl is not big enough for two turtle? (laughs) He loves them. He's so sweet. He loves his animals. I I don't think he sees it. You know, I think... Yeah, you know, I know. It's ridiculous that two turtles are literally in a a (laughs) popcorn bowl. (laughs) <laughs> he has those two turtles in Rocky Balboa in that tank. And of course, they're huge mm-hmm. compared to what they are now. I don't think the tank, given their increased size, was that much bigger than this bowl. Same, like, same. It's just like you're just in this prison cell type of <laughs> environment. For sure. Turtles don't have our minds either, so maybe they don't get bored as easily or whatever. I don't know. I think turtles, well, I know fish have bad memories. The attention span, a goldfish has like a seven or eight second. It's an attention span. I don't know if it's a memory. And the only reason I know that is because it was used in a slide at like a marketing presentation about how our attention span is that of a goldfish. Humans can't concentrate on things for more than like eight seconds either. Okay, did you just say something? (laughs) You got me. It takes me a minute. I'm like, oh. But getting back to Rocky, I love that he brings their friend Moby Dick over. We all forget about Moby Dick. Everyone talks about Cuff and Link the Turtles. And I know. They're, they're still alive to this day, but I'm pretty certain Moby Dick has passed on in the last I'm 20 years. I'm certain he did. Yep. Hey, you guys hungry? You guys yeah. hungry? He feeds him some fish. Here you go. More moths and flies. I think so. Does he get caught in his throat? <laughs> Want to see your friend Moby Dick, huh? Oh, Moby Dick, you miss me today or what? This is the first time you really hear him talk, too. You hear him talk a little bit before. This is like the first time you really get to know him. This is our introduction to him as a person. Oh, look, he's talking to his pets. He's, you know, he's bringing Moby Dick over from the fireplace mantle or whatever. So So there's the Rocky. He clearly idolizes Rocky Marciano. It's the biggest piece of art in the room. And Mickey talks about him. I... 
oddly enough, have not even really looked up much about Rocky Marciano. Do you guys know much about him? A little bit. Rocky Marciano was champion in the 50s. In the 70s, yeah, it's only 20 years ago. So, like, if we think back to 2000, that doesn't seem that long ago. True. Yeah. Rocky Marciano was never defeated ever. He retired from boxing. I think oh. 50 something and 0 or 49. I don't know. Similar to me. Like, I looked right it here. up. It's like 63 and 0. Rocky Marciano was. There was a conversation in the other podcast I had about the debate on whether he or Muhammad Ali was the greatest of all time. Mm. Oh, interesting. Also, he, so he must be Italian. He, yeah, he is Italian American. His name is not actually Rocky Marciano. I guess his name isn't really Rocky. He mm-hmm. went by that name, but he, he was born with some like really Italian sounding name mm. and just went by Rocky Marciano. But he is actually a similar fighter to Rocky in the sense that he's smaller for a heavyweight. He's not that big. He fought low. It was not graceful at all. He just put the pressure on you hardcore. He was really tough. He could take a hit. Rocky Marciano actually is a good comparison. So when Mickey says, like, you move like him, you have heart like him, that's not bullshit. Like, oh, that is true. cool. His name was Rocco Francis Marciangio. So I don't know if I pronounced that right, but that's the Italian name. So they changed it. It's spelled like M-A-R-C-H-E-G-I-A-N-O. So they changed it to Marciano because I guess it'd be easier for us Anglophones to say. Yeah. But his name was Rocco. Birth name was Rocco. Oh, I yeah. love that name. Yeah. If you never saw Rocky, if you never saw this movie before, because I don't know if any of us actually remember the first time we saw this film. If you've never seen it, you don't know what he's like, and you could think that he's like dark and mean and kind of a, a more of a screwed up type of character. But when he's talking to his turtles there and he brings the fish over, you kind of see a softer, more jovial side to him. It really kind of sets the tone there because Rocky. This is his darkest film for sure, and he is darker in this film than others, but even so, he's actually quite lighthearted throughout a lot of it. Despite his circumstances, yeah. The animal thing, as an animal lover, the theme throughout all of the Rocky movies, I think that helps me love him. I mean, I think that's part of it. So seeing this, granted, he probably partially has them because he's trying to suck up to Adrian, but he likes them. He loves them. He did not appreciate Mickey's comment about the turtle soup and stuff. And there's lots of nuggets in this apartment, too. My dream job is to be the person that sets up these places like that. Mm -hmm. I think Sly did a lot of the setup, or it's a lot of his actual personal stuff in here. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a gun on the wall somewhere here that's actually his. I think we've seen the date scene, not this one. Mm. Yeah. Uh, We got a picture of the picture here of him playing football on the wall. And then I think just over here, you got a football trophy that he won right over his shoulder right there. See, There were a few other trophies on the left side of the mantle as well. Little small trophies. Again, I think it's weird. Meaning um, an adult person showcasing like frank with his letterman jacket like he's still wearing his letterman jacket from high school and rocky still has trophies up seemingly from high school sports so it it just seems odd you're like a 30 year old person with your high school trophies showcased i've noticed that with people my parents age and a little older they put more stock into high school than we Mm. do for our generation high school is just seen as a given do you ever go to a high school reunion i did for my 10 year and that's it i don't think they're held anymore the way they used to be yeah because people don't give a shit about high school anymore no. you're almost expected to go to university now or do something else high school now is what middle school would have been to this generation okay. and so i think people put more stock into high school but i also think katie's right in the sense that rocky probably hasn't accomplished anything since high school really like other than his fighting career which is kind of so so like he's probably proud of that football thing. That's probably one of the last really great things he's done. I guess it would be 12 years since high school or 13 years since I, if he finished. I think he went to grade nine. He did not he finish. Said. Nine or 10, I think he says in that interview. He probably wouldn't have been playing. I don't know what your terms are in America, like varsity football or whatever. I guess, but yeah. And so I wouldn't be doing this shit. So he tells the turtles and the fish, you know. I wouldn't be getting myself beaten up every night if you guys could sing or dance. So he cute. Uses that twice, you know, the singer dance. So hang his jacket up here on the uh, machete. Shadow boxes with the beat up mattress. He hangs up his hat on a knife in the wall. 
And what I love here, this is a really cool scene because we all know the scene and we know where it's going. But when you're first time watching this, he just starts monologuing. And this turtle food I got here has got more uh, moth and fly, see? And then he says, well, who the hell cares? And it's a very interesting, like, why is he monologuing this? And then why is he acting so discouraged by it at the same time? And we find out later is because, yeah, he's cracking jokes with this shy girl at a pet shop. And she's not reciprocating his jokes very much or as quickly as he hopes. So he's even feeling discouraged, of course, about his love life, about his companionship life. And this is a scene that makes sense with repeat viewing. It's one that doesn't quite make sense the first viewing. That's such a good point. Well, also, it's this movie is children like it less because it's partially to that point. I remember being a kid watching this. I was like, what's going on here? And you don't know until later. So I, it's a really nice touch. He's looking in the mirror while he's doing this, and there's a whole bunch of photos black and white photos, one when he's 8, 10, and he's so cute. Third grade there. He's so cute. And then the upper left one, it looks like his actual senior picture. Yeah. Maybe he didn't graduate, but you can still be with the classes. He didn't, quote, unquote, get a GED or general education degree, whatever they call it, a grade 12 degree. But he still went to school till grade 12, and then he just never completed high school. That could be what it means. I I don't think so. (laughs) Yeah. I just Uh, think it was... They didn't think this much about it. And then there's a picture of his parents. Yeah. It's literally, I think, the only parent talk ever. They exist in the universe. They do exist. Yeah. And talk about existing in the universe, Rocky Marciano exists in Rocky's universe. And uh, Sly mentioned that by doing that, he recognized that right away he's already kind of blurred the reality and fantasy in this movie by mentioning a real-life boxer in a fictitious film. We have real-life characters existing in Rocky's professional career. So are any of these people contenders? Did he beat these people? Or you know, So the idea that Rocky Marciano and Rocky eventually will both held the same title. Rocky Marciano's fighting career doesn't match up with Rocky Balboa. They easily could exist in the same universe. Because Rocky Marciano stopped fighting in the 50s when Rocky was like this 8-year-old. To me, the real problematic thing is they have Joe Frazier in this movie. That, to me, is the real issue, because it's like, what, what happened to Joe Frazier? Yeah, they've introduced real-life people in the, in, the, uh, in the fictitious world of Rocky. To build off what you are saying there, Katie, that the pictures of the parents, it is interesting that we see, again, in this, you know, the Rocky universe, that Rocky does have parents, and then he must love them or have some sort of fondness for them that he would put them on his wall. But we never see them, of course, on screen as characters. The only thing we really know about them is that he was told, you know, because, you know, because you don't have much of a brain, you better learn how to fight. That's the only. And then we learn, of course, in the latest scene of Rocky Balboa, that dad went to jail. <laughs> yeah, no, don't yeah. like it. But yeah. <laughs> and there's another football reference here, too. In the top right, yeah. there's a circle. Keystone Conference champs. Yeah. So Pennsylvania is the Keystone State. Oh, okay. I'm assuming that his football was some sort of state championship, which I think I'm guessing Sly, that's a real thing from him. Like Sly was probably in something like that. Well, the pictures we, are I, real. There's a picture of him yeah. again, like his football uniform, like posing for like the pictures of whatever year that was. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, decal or decal, as they say in the States, is uh, 1967. So that's when he won that championship. Which is weird because Sly was born in 47, wasn't he? 46. 46. So he would have been 21, which is well outside of him being in high school. So maybe that's not. It's, uh, this turtle food got here had more flies in it. No more moths in it than flies. No more fly, more moths than who the hell cares. Now here's the scene that Doug was talking about in his email about now Rocky's frustrated about his monologue that he wants to give to Adrian after he practices it. Who the hell cares? Throws the food down. Now he looks at the picture of that kid and he thinks to himself, how did that poor innocent little boy become the beat-up pug who lives in this crappy apartment, can't get a girl? How did we get here? It's a great unspoken acting and moment here by Sly and the director, John G. Albertson, that we all know what's happening. But that's an amazing storytelling that we can get that from this. I agree with Doug's comment 100%. Sly always likes to take from real life. I'm guessing he's been in this situation where he's, he's been in his crappy apartment. He talks about his crappy apartment in L.A. before he got Rocky and probably has looked in the mirror and, and thought this before. He probably doesn't have to 
really dig a lot to find out what that emotion's like. He has that emotion on hand and, and could replicate it in the film here. Mm-hmm. The way the camera pans in that scene was really brilliant. It like, focuses in on a close-up of the child's picture and then kind of goes back and forth and then it pans over, because he's looking in the mirror, and then it, it pans over to the real Rocky as he walks away, disgusted, seemingly. Look at the walls and the drawers. And, <laughs> that's what I mean. It's all... Oh, well. Get some ice out of the icebox. I'm shocked he even has ice cube trays. That Really? <laughs> He doesn't care that, like, ice cubes are falling on the floor. I think he's at the point where you don't give a shit. He doesn't even put them in a cloth or a towel or anything. He just holds them in his hand. A few ice cubes. Yeah, that always kills me because you your hands are going to freeze a lot sooner than the swell in your head will go down when you put the cold compress on. So he's doing the right thing. Put a cold compress on your swollen part of your body. <laughs> but, yeah, your hands are going to freeze before it does anything good to your forehead. An underrated aspect of this scene is the music. Mm-hmm. I don't know what this music is. But I know who it is. It's from this Casey and the Sunshine Band, I believe. It's an instrumental. Oh, really? Song. Yeah, it's an instrumental from one of their songs. He lays on his shitty... It's not even a twin, is it? I mean, what is that bed? It's a single like it for seems... sure. A toddler, maybe. A toddler. I know it does kind of look like a toddler bed. But this super shitty bed, and there's crap all over it. And there's like a shelf on the wall and to your point about that he's probably religious he does have a crucifix Crucifix. right on the wall look at the time and we'll catch the time it's quarter to midnight where are you seeing that i don't see a there's a small clock below a bottle that's by the crucifix oh i'm so blind i can't see okay yep all right so we'll stop it there that's perfect we had a lot of great discussions today (laughs) The first 15 minutes was, you know, I threw you guys for a loop by playing that NFT from Sly announcement. Oh, yeah. So that took up 15, 20 minutes of discussion, which I think is great that this podcast, as we go through it live and we go throughout 2022 and 2023, whatever year this is done, you know, as we go through, we're going to get Sly news, you know, and I think it's important that we do talk about as it comes up to talk about the side news. I do want to keep this podcast evergreen to to a large degree. Like we're not going to talk politics or current events per se in the world because I want people to be able to listen to it at any, at any point. However, Sly news such as that, you know, a new movie projects or NFTs, those things we will talk about because, you know, I think people might still want to hear our reactions on certain things. And as things develop, you know, we'll, we might change our opinions about projects or movies or what have you. So I just want to point out the bum count was zero in this episode. Oh, yeah, there was very little speaking, if any. Yeah, good point. He didn't call the people standing around the fire bums or anything. No, no, they get better every year. They get better every year. Yeah, I know, I know. Okay, all right. Well, I don't know. I'm I'm going to lose, I think. Maybe. <laughs> we'll watch the film left, okay? Don't, don't lose hope. Uh, so I just want to thank everyone that's joined us in our Discord. We had about four or five people actually join us at once today. Uh, people came and went, but we had John Rambo joined us in Discord. Um, oh. Louise joined us, Donald. So yeah, we thank everyone that joined us in Discord. If you want to join us in Discord for these live recordings, again, just join our Discord description in every episode of how to join. Just click on the link and you're in the server. And I always announce when we go live in that server. Katie, well, the episode's over. I didn't hear no bell. I just want to say what